Well, phew. Okay. So, uh, so uh, we're we're preparing for um, His Holiness, who's going to teach the essence, the essence of the essence of true eloquence, uh, in two days in November, and. Uh, his favorite work of Tibetan, Indo-Tibetan philosophy. It draws on the, it's the Tsongkhapa's, draws on his understanding of the tradition coming from Nagarjuna, from, of course from Shakyamuni Buddha, Prajna Paramita Sutras, and then Nagarjuna, and then all the way down in India until Tibet, and then through, through the various teachers in Tibet. There's a tradition in Tibet that there are, they're called the three Manjushris, and of course, Manjushri is, as I think I mentioned to people yesterday, I mean last time, is the Buddha who made a vow that when he was, after being a Buddha, he would be a Bodhisattva in all worlds where Buddhas were teaching uh, transcendent wisdom, Prajna Paramita, <coughs> and uh, which people call perfection of wisdom, which is another possible translation. And um, it's the wisdom that transcends ordinary dualistic knowledge, the wisdom that understands everything by becoming everything, something like that. So anyway, it trans it's not transcendent in the sense of leaving the universe, but it's transcendence in terms of merging with the universe, transcending the isolated subjective subjectivity that perceives other things as alien, alien objects. Uh, so, and then whenever Buddha is uh, teaching that subject, then Manjushri incarnates there, supposedly, and he asks a question. That's the tough question of the Buddha. Like, what are you talking about? Okay, so then, uh, uh, then there are, you know, for thousands of years, there are different interpretations of this. Because one thing, and the highest interpretation of it is, is that there is no, there's no dogmatic or formulaic description of what reality is. In other words, no theory, it's, it's only mind, or it's this or that, captures reality. Reality eludes the you know, dualistic concepts, okay? Uh, but in a way that describes reality, that negation. In other words, the negation that all concepts, that any concept can encapsulate reality, uh, that is reality that negation. It opens the mind to that reality. Um, and it's, and the, the mind understands that reality as, a nega as you understand a negation. For example, which is not that mysterious, don't look worried. <laughs> if, if, you, uh, if someone says there's no elephant in this room, or oh, say no live elephant in this room, somebody may have an elephant charm bracelet or something, <laughs> there's no live elephant in this room, then you look around the room if it's a really big room or something, and you look under things or wherever, there could be an elephant according to what you think an elephant might be. And at some point you decide it's no, not necessary to keep looking. It isn't like you come to closure over a certain thing, like you do in a dualistic piece of knowledge. You say, that's a pillar. And it seems to correspond to your concept of a pillar. So it's like, bang, you, you know, it's like you close, your concept closes on the pillar. And that's one kind of cognition. But reality cannot be closed on like that. However, uh, there's no elephant in the room. Uh, you, you live living elephant in the room. Um, you never close on anything. It's just you don't find the elephant you expect, you try to find. Do you follow me? So similarly, emptiness means that things are empty of some sort of intrinsic essence, some sort of non-relational thing. In other words, that resists analysis and that is the composer, the that is the constituent, the sort of ultimate irreducible constituent of reality. And when you, when, you, when you don't find any such thing, when everything dissolves under analysis and experiential analysis as well as, as analytic or verbal analysis, in other words, you sort of develop through, because you develop a higher power of concentration. If anybody needs a text, uh, Tajila is coming around with text. Uh, you know, then things will actually disappear in front of you. For example, the Buddha on the morning of the of his enlightenment, he he uh, highest enlightenment, everything disappeared. And even but 
And, and many people would then think that, oh, enlightenment is some sort of thing where the world disappears, so there's no more problem of the world, right? But the problem is that the disappearance also disappeared. And when the disappearance disappears, then what's there? Everything is back in a different way, if you follow me. In other words, emptiness itself is empty, meaning even the concept of sort of negation, being empty of something and you don't find anything, and the experience of not finding anything is like an ex is in a way is like a finding of disappearance. It's like the finder disappears, the findable disappears. But then that state of disappearing also disappears. So then you're back, in a way. And everything else is back. But you're back, perhaps you're back in a different way. For example, and um, well, I can just to jump ahead a little bit, what we will re I think we will reach today in talking about the second wheel of Dharma, which we will come to. And that is the idea of the unborn nature of reality, the unproduced nature of the universe, the uncreated nature. What is the solution? You know, people in the West or in a theistic culture, which are most cultures, and also people by their common sense experience who see things having beginnings and endings, People then think, well, everything is here. Like, how did it all begin? And then the pretension of the high priest in a religious or theistic culture, and nowadays the pretension of the high priests of secular materialism, which are MIT scientists and Columbia scientists and NYU scientists and Harvard scientists, etc., their pretension is, oh yeah, they, they got it, the Big Bang. It was the first milliseconds of the Big Bang. There was cosmic inflation. <laughs> and sometimes they get a little embarrassed by that kind of a claim, like, oh, there was a Big Bang out of where? Out of, out of nothing. You know, and then the creatio ex nihilo, you know, ancient theological, you know, creation out of nothingness. But then they, they feel a little uncomfortable having their theory replace God. So they then say, well, maybe it's a black hole in another universe. And it just looks like nothing, but the whole energy of the other universe was compressed into this infinite black hole. There's a seat over here, my dear. Hello, there's a seat right here, but you know, you're a little bit near the wind here, so maybe you prefer to be more peaceful in the back. <laughs> and um, and so, so then they, they come up with all these kind of things, like it was that there's you know, another one before that, another one before, because actually, commonsensically, you never find the beginning of anything out of nothing. In fact, it's completely incoherent to talk about anything out of nothing. And even the theological thing of God created everything out of nothing, God wasn't nothing, and he was hanging around. So it all came out of him, that means. That just means there's nothing other than him, actually, is what it really means, that theological thing. Because nobody's ever had seen anything come out of nothing. And nobody's ever seen nothing, actually. Actually, there is a meditative realm called the realm of absolute nothingness that the Buddha described as an experience that you could be confused and think it was nothing. But actually, it's a realm, a meditative realm, where you sort of get stuck in a state of things having disappeared and you having disappeared. And that's a, that's a very, it's a trap, actually, because your subliminal consciousness has constructed the idea of nothing, and then you're sort of in this black space, and then you become this black, dark space, and then you disappear. And you think, geez whiz, that's really what was really there. But, and so it, it's your experience of a kind of a medium or a space. But, um, but it's obviously not nothing, because you experienced it, and then you come back from that experience. Although they say if someone has that experience as a, as a high yogi meditator, yogini or yogi meditator, and they misinterpret it, they become nihilistic. And they say a theoretical nihilist, like a secular materialist, is someone you can still talk to, but an experiential nihilist is hopeless. You cannot talk to them. Because they, they have a reference in their mind of that time when I was, I was nothing. And so they stay holding on to that like a real solid something, that experience. But of course, it's a something for them, it's not nothing. Because nothing is nothing. That's a big eureka. Nothing is nothing. It's a beginning to wake up from our psychosis that we live in, the psychosis of thinking that our language means things in some realistic way, to realize that nothing is nothing. 
doesn't re there's no reference for nothing. It's a designation that has no reference. Okay? Okay, so I'm not going to go back over the opening verses for those of you who were not here. But just let it be said that um, Zonkapa, so just quickly to bring you up to speed a little bit of where we're going to go, we're going to start on the second page. Uh, uh, this Lama Zonkapa, who lived 1357, passed away in 1419. Although he passed away in a rather extraordinary manner, they say, his, uh, his disciples were present and his body turned into an, a 16-year-old youth. And then he, he, he met with a, a, a female angel and the two of them went off in a, one of those yabyums, what they call father-mother union images, and disappeared in a burst of light. And, uh, and people were pretty, like, slipped out by that. You know. <laughs> and uh, his disciples, but, you know, maybe they all made it up. Modern scholars would say, well, they mythicalized it, they made it up. We all know that sort of thing can't happen because reality is made out of pre-Einsteinian, pre-quantum atoms. And that couldn't happen to atoms. So never mind. So, but anyway, he had an experience in 1398, 21 years before he died, where he felt he understood everything. And he says so. I have seen it quite precisely by the grace of my guru, the savior Manju Gosha, I should say. I don't know how that got to be Gosha. I have to correct that. And I, that's Manju Shri. And I'm going to explain it from great love. Listen, with reverence, you aspire to peerlessness in philosophy with the critical discrimination that realizes the vastness, the, 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 the appropriateness, the correctness, the just preciseness of the teaching. And he wrote a poem that morning of that highest awareness that he had, which he maintained then through the next 21 years, and after death even. And uh, he, according to them, uh, and that was called the lesser essence of true eloquence. And then um, nine years later, he wrote this book that we are reading. And His, and his Holiness will teach the essence of that essence, uh, which is called the greater essence of true eloquence. OK, so, so, that, so he just salutes to those who he considers his ancestors, uh, spiritual ancestors. Uh, because in a way, when you when you realize that you are spirit, then you more look to your spiritual ancestors than your blood ancestors, actually. Which, of course, is one of the great things about the biological theory of karma. That, you know, karma was a wonderful biological theory, is a wonderful biological theory, and had a big impact in Asia, just in history, whether or not we will get into whether it's correct or not. We won't get into that now, although there are many arguments that it is. Uh, and it was, and uh, you know, such thing as re, you know, reincarnation, metempsychosis was was just common sense in the Mediterranean, about two thousand years ago, um, and uh, so it's you know, widespread world, you know, mundane idea. But the great thing about the biology of karma is that it lessens sexism, nationalism, racism, religious fanaticism, because you know the powers that be when they try to use we all hate all the Russians, or we hate all the Muslims, or we hate all the non-Muslims, or we hate the whites, or the blacks, or the yellows, or the purples, or whatever. You know, or we like those who have a different religion, or who think God has a different name, or who don't think there is a God, we hate them. These things are all lessened by the fact that maybe in your previous life you were one of them. <laughs> and maybe next life you'll be one of them again. Like there's a wonderful documented story in the Stevenson literature about this young a uh, Burmese woman who, as a small child, kept trying to like roll cigarettes and cigars out of anything she could find, you know, and liked to eat fish raw. She didn't like to cook it, which the Burmese didn't do. And she, so she was trying to make sushi and everything. She had a birthmark in her neck, on t and then this side and on this side. And finally, when she got a little older, where she could talk, they realized that. She said she was a Japanese soldier who had been killed in the war and with a bullet through his head like that. And they later found the body and everything with the bullet hole and the skull and everything. And she was like trying to like smoke, smoke whatever she could find <laughs> and, uh, and eat sushi, which they didn't do in that climate, you know, because it was like it's not healthy. She was, you know, those fish come out of the Mekong. She was like carving them up, you know, or the Irrawaddy or whatever they call it. And, uh, and so um, I, I shouldn't get distracted. OK. So oh, yeah. So the karma theory erodes all of these things. Like the male who thinks they're so great and females are something lesser, 
was a female, the previous wife. The female, who rightfully thinks males are a pain, she was a male in the previous wife, etc. You know, so everybody, it sort of mingles people up, and therefore the Asian people were conquered by the more uptight Western people, uh, which is to their credit. You know, the people who beat the other people up are the lesser people, actually. And the people who are more gentle are the greater people, which someday the history will perhaps tell that story. Nowadays, it's still like Harvard Christian soldiers, you know, it's still sung here and there. And, and, the, and then we have people at Harvard writing about oh, the greatness of empire. You know. So we're not quite there yet to recognize that. But we do on our block, if some protection racket starts on our block and somebody comes up and demands protection payment or they'll beat us up, we don't think that's a higher person. We may be scared by them and may be coerced by them, but we don't think they're superior. We don't. We think they're a bunch of bullies and pains. You know? right? Okay, so that's just a side thing about karma. Okay, now, on page two, we said the Lord said, the Lord is where we translate Bhagavan, and Bhagavan is one of the names of Buddha. Bhagavan, one who has good luck, actually, it means. The lucky, the lucky one, Bhagavan. Bhagavan is a possessive particle, meaning possessing. And Bhaga has a lot of meanings, actually. But it basically means good fortune. It means a share, a Bhaga. It, it means some other things, too, which well, maybe later I'll tell you, but not now. Anyway, so this is a famous Mahayana Sutra, and it's a... I've been thinking about this verse all week in Tibetan. I don't know why the Tibetan comes. I don't remember Tibetan verses usually, but this one I kept remembering. So in the translation it says, the way is empty, peaceful, and uncreated. Not knowing that, the living beings wander. Moved by compassion, he introduces them with hundreds of reasons and technical procedures. So, and then in commentary, we, we have to add a few things, you know. Uh, wander means they wander in the cyclic life, you know, in the six ways of, you know, we are now so fortunate in the Buddhist view. We are human beings. We are human beings born with leisure and intelligence and with our full faculties. And therefore, we have a chance of coming to understand our evolutionary destiny and history and, no lo and slowly and gradually coming to gain control of what our subliminal subconscious drives are and thereby begin to take control of our evolutionary future and no longer be dragged by lust or hate or greed or confusion or envy or, or pride into any negative life form which, of course, a materialist doesn't worry about because they have the automatic thing that just dying there, out of there, the problem is over, right? Materialist. How many of you think, by the way, when you die, you're going to be nothing? Don't be, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> How many of you think that? You do? You think so? So you're going to be nothing. Well, I, I won't grab you. I won't mind. It's okay. <laughs> you're going to be that nothing that doesn't exist. Okay. So... But you can't, but I won't, I won't get the argument. Only one person, but probably others do, but the one person brave enough to say. Yeah. And actually, those of us who think, well, I might have a future life, we might be thinking naively that next life I'd rather live in Brooklyn or something. <laughs> you know, or next life I'd be more whatever, or I'll be, you know, some other thing, you know, in California, you know. And uh, so we're thinking naively that it would sort of just be the same automatically. And then deeper down underneath, we kind of have this feeling that, you know, the materialist doctors and scientists, and they might have found something out, and maybe it is just an old-fashioned superstitious idea. So in a way, we don't viscerally necessarily believe that, because when you viscerally feel that at death, you go into like a dream state, like when you fall asleep asleep, after some period of being just unconscious, you go into a dream-type state, and then the way you experience that dream type state and what you see as something, this is a dream type state where you don't just wake up back in your regular previous body. You kind of early part of the dream, you sort of actually see your body and at first you don't realize it's you and then people are making a fuss and you go up and try to shake their shoulders. You remember the movie Ghost? 
you know, he was trying to say to his wife, come on, it's me, you know, and that she didn't, you know, only Whoopi could find him, you know, knew he was there, psychic, you know. And, uh, and so that happens to you after you die, they say, in the early part of the dream, and then you sort of float away from your body and you could be in another universe, you could be at a, on a different planet, you could be, you could be sort of in other sort of planes where you, you adopt sort of animal forms, depending on your unconscious. And, um, and then whatever you gravitate toward, then you're reborn in that form. And the danger for the, for the person who has not become enlightened to the extent of becoming aware of their, of their eros and thanatos in their unconscious, you know, what Freud called eros and thanatos, and who is not aware of that and is therefore driven by blind drives and impulses, those impulses will drive them toward some places where they won't end up being happy when they kind of wake up in a body or in a womb or in an egg or in whatever it might be. And therefore, uh, you know, I mean, just to give you an example, one Lama, a friend of mine, who, late, uh, late Lama, he passed away a long time back, but he, um, he was with me and um, he lived with us for a while in Amherst when I was taught there years ago, 30 years ago, and he, he was very upset about Miss Piggy. He really was upset about Miss Piggy. And he, he watched himself, Miss Piggy, thought she was quite cute, but then he got all worried, and we said, well, what's wrong with Miss Piggy? He said, well, some child might fall in love because, well, with Miss Piggy. And then if they died prematurely in an accident or some disease or something, they might gravitate toward a pig rebirth. And he was very worried about it. He said, they shouldn't be showing that all the time in such color with lipstick and whatever, you know, and all golden tresses and uh, Miss Piggy, you know. And he was really worried about it. And we kept saying, but Rinpoche, the Buddhists always had animal stories, and they had like the nice rabbit who jumped and fed the traveler and got drawn his picture in the moon and blah, 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 like Lassie-type stories, Disney stories. And he said, yeah, but they didn't have it on TV and making imprint in the mind like, like many hours a day, you know, type of thing. So he was very concerned about it. Just, but that's just an idea of how they understand it in their own common sense plane. And this relates to a fact about Buddhist psychology that is interesting to Western psychologists. It's a little bit digression, but it's interesting, which is that Buddhist psychology certainly knows there is an unconscious, and it long thousands of years before Freud, it, it talks about the unconscious. But it doesn't think of it as an ultimately and inevitably unconscious zone of the mind. In other words, the unexamined person who has become unself-aware and unexamined and uncontemplative about their becoming aware of the way their mind works, has big unconscious and is very driven by all kinds of unconscious impulses, not really because doesn't know what they are, kind of, and even is in denial about many of them. But the, since that's considered dangerous to die like that, if you're human, since you have the ability to analyze yourself and using concentration investigate yourself, with the deeper, deep sort of drilling down into your, your psyche and your drives, uh, the unconscious is, is, the enlightenment means becoming completely conscious of all of your mental energy. So you can kind of like draw the line out, you know, move the line between conscious and unconscious. You know, tip of the iceberg, you investigate the entire iceberg. That's the purpose of life, actually, according to them. It isn't just that you... Like Freud thought, you know, you sort of get where there isn't anything too bottled up in there, and you can vent a little here and there, and you can integrate, and you can not be in denial that you have these things, but you can sublimate them and so on. But you can't really know them. But the Buddhist thing is the human life form is the opportunity to really know them, and to no longer be driven at all by impulse, and to really be able to, to, to uh, transcend any kind of thing and make reasonable have reasonable emotions and reasonable uh, decisions and actions and really become self-controlled, truly self-controlled, and, and able to, and, uh, to, to almost miraculous level, I have to say, which, which we, of course, modern and materialist people don't believe, but anyway, that's, that is the Buddhist view, and that's what they think Buddha did. Okay, so now, the way is empty, peaceful, and uncreated. Now, that means that the reality is this emptiness, peaceful, and it's uncreated. So that means, in a way, that this is a kind of shocking thing. This means that if you really look at yourself, and you look even at the pillar, and you look at the world, everything will disappear. And you, it, you will 
it, you will realize that everything is somehow not happening. Now, this is completely preposterous to us as materialists, right? But look what we think. We do think that cosmic rays, like people to find cosmic rays, scientists, they go way down deep in some salt mine because there's some kind of a ray that goes through all kinds of seemingly solid things, right? And they go and they see patterns in the salt mine, some sort of, they have like some sensitive liquid or something, and they see patterns in the salt mine of something that they see going through seemingly solid matter. So even this seemingly really solid pillar is mostly, is made of atoms and molecules, et cetera, subatomic particles. And, and you know, right, the model of the atom is like a mini little solar system, except there isn't anything as big as a sun in it. It's like the nucleus is tiny. I think, what do they have? A, they have an analogy of a flea on central, on the home plate in the middle of Yankee Stadium. Size of a flea. So it's all empty space. And then the, the electron going around it is like a few fleas in the bleachers. And the rest of the atom is totally empty. So even the solidest wall, we think at a deeper level of analysis of reality, we think as sort of common sense, right? We all think about atoms, right? You know, we have, we have a nuclear bomb and they blow it all up, right? And so, and yet we, we see it as totally solid. And we have a conviction that our perception of its total solidity is the real thing. And yet we know that instruments, you know, scientific instruments see it's not the real thing at all, right? So we can go that far. Now, what the Buddhist claim is, is that you, if you become a true yogi or yogini, you yourself can become aware of what they are aware of in a cyclotron or with a microscope or an electron microscope or whatever machinery you like. Because after all, the brain itself uh, is neurons. They are made of atoms and molecules. So you can kind of get into your own, you can do your own machine, machine diagnostic of the machine of your sense organs. And, your, and the brain that organizes the sense data and puts them in under this and that, files them under this and that memory concept and things like that. You actually can do that. So, so when Buddha and the Buddhists later argued with the Indian materialist physicists in, their, in ancient time, and they demanded to know the reason for why Buddha went against the atomic theories of his age by saying that atoms could not withstand analysis. And they said, well, what's your evidence for that? And he said, I saw, they dissolved under my analysis. I analyzed them and they disappeared. In other words, you keep taking something apart and eventually then the parts take apart and the parts take apart. In other words, quantum people have had that experience too. But they don't give up because their inner um, you know, predilection is that there is something they're going to find and we'll, they can catch it. That's the constituent. And then from that, they're going to build back up reality. You know? Bertrand Russell had the idea of the simple a notational or mathematical system that would fit with the simple objects of reality from which it was constituted. The idea that it dissolves under analysis had quantum people have discovered, but that most of the scientists are fighting against it still. And all those big machines, and the Higgs boson, we know now it's mass, and there's dark matter and dark energy, and, we, and so we're saved from falling into the abyss of complete uncertainty of what it is, which is what they're afraid of. What, because there's an experience, when you get on the brink of realization of emptiness, it's, you feel like you're going to fall into an abyss. Because why? Because we're going around saying, yeah, this chair and my hand, these are all, oh, they're solid. But every single one of us faints, dies, and this all disappears instantly. And even those of you who think you won't exist by dying, you, you think the deeper reality of you, the longer term reality of you, is the nothing you're going to hit. And you know, if you have a really, you know, like some guy who commits harakiri, you know, he just can't bear to be in the body and in the society with the shame and with whatever, or even dear Robin Williams, and he thinks he's going to be say, escape from it, and that he'll go to the deeper reality, which is where it's all calm and peaceful. Now, that reality is uncreated and already peaceful because it's empty. That is an experience you have while alive without dying. Although maybe on the brink of it, there is a little fear that, it, that maybe you might die when you really come to that understanding. That's why it's not that easy. It's actually easy logically, but maybe not that easy. Hello, Helene, how are you? It's not that easy, it's not that easy experientially. 
because like, like Don Gabba was teaching some of his disciples later about emptiness and selflessness, which is a synonym of emptiness. And one of the disciples was like, <laughs> like was like this, pulling his collar of his monk, his monk's little jacket that they have in Tibet, like a little vest thing that they have. And the other, the other disciples were like, stop making a fuss over here. You know, we're trying to listen to the lecture. And then someone said, no, he's, he's really getting it. Don't f let him fuss. Because he was de so deeply thinking. He'd been perhaps contemplating. He'd perhaps been on retreat. And he was deeply thinking about this emptiness. And he was getting to a place where he, he wasn't quite sure that he was going to be find whatever piece of voluntary you know, autonomic nervous system there was that would, it would, from whence he might decide to draw another breath. So he's feeling very, very short of breath. He's feeling like he might suffocate. He might lose his air. He might disappear or something, which is, which is good, which is, which is hip. He was hip to that fact. So, so not knowing that, though, living beings want to know, we think, we're always going somewhere. We're going we're to get to a better place. We're going to escape from the bad guys. We're going to escape from the, from the um, place where there's a bad air or, or pollution or whatever. We're, we're going to make it some other place, you know. So, and then we're going to get from, we're going to escape from this bad life. We're going to get to a better life. You know, so that means we're wandering in the life cycle, which goes all the way from hell to, to 20, to let's see, 16, uh, 6, 22, 4, 20, 20, uh, uh, 26 different heavenly planes. And uh, 31 different possible rebirth places, according to them. They have a kind of stratification of it. So wandering from one to another. Even, to, even when you become a god, you still are not finished because you still are thinking, I'm god and they are not god. It's still dual dualism, you know. And you, human beings, we've all been gods, actually. And they said, there, there was one thing I discovered years of teaching Buddhism. I almost fainted in a class. <laughs> I was reading an assignment to, to a class up at Columbia, like 100 kids. And I was reading this thing they're called the Brahma Jala uh, from the Pali, from the Theravada tradition. The net of Brahma it was called Sutra. And in it, there was one type of theist who the Buddha said, you will never convince this type of person that there isn't an omnipotent creator who controls the universe and created it. And he said, why? But he said, well, in, this pre in a previous life, this person was the creator god, Brahma, who the world thinks is the creator god, in other words, in India at the time. And, and the experience that a Brahma, ha a, Brahma, a Brahma has in a particular universe, cycle of a universe is, they are a very fortunate being from previous experience in previous universes. And then they're the first being to be reborn when a universe emerges from its state of dissolution. And they're all alone for a moment, for a while. And then other beings suddenly show up in their heavenly plane. And there's no planets or things at that point. It's just a vast sea of energy. And then other beings show up around them. And then, then the other beings see them there and they say, oh, father. <laughs> oh God, you know, and uh, and this and Brahma in Buddha's world told Buddha that when they said that to me, I first said to them, "I'm not your father. I just came here first. I'm like, well, I'm not sure what's going on." And then they became very threatened. The other beings, they became very freaked out. This is what God told Buddha. And so then I said, "Okay, okay, I'm dad. I'm your dad. It's okay. I got under control." <laughs> but he knew all along that he wasn't because he didn't have omnipotent power over everything. He couldn't. And then when he likes Buddha, that Brahma does, in this world system, because Buddha tells people that when horrible things happen to them, the Holocaust, you know, their children being killed or dying, or, or themselves dying, or really terrible things, it's not God's fault. It's the karma. It's their own previous existence and you know, different things ripening to them and so forth that causes it. And God does his best for them, but he can't help it sometimes. So he says, please don't tell them that, Buddha. Tell them that it's, I didn't. I don't bring the evil upon them. I always try to do good for them. He's a very nice Brahma, and he really gets into it as a Buddha, as Buddha student. And uh, in the in the even in the Pali literature, it isn't just Mahayana. And 
Sometimes Buddha visits different heaven planes and teaches a bunch of gods who are partying like mad and they don't really want to stop partying and listen to Buddha. And then Brahma comes down from his highest heaven and he says, you guys, he's like a Zen proctor, you know, like, you guys sit down and listen to Buddha, you know, because you're not going to be partying permanently because even gods come to an end, the karma, the good generosity and the patience and the beauty that brought them to the heavenly plane will exhaust itself and then they'll fall again and they'll be very unhappy when that happens back to the smelly world, you know, when they've been living in these, and the, and the heavens are really intense, you know, in Indian imagination at least. So, so, um, uh, so they're, you know, wandering around like that, so that they, but because they don't know that it's empty, peaceful, and uncreated. The only way you can really realize it's the uncreation of everything is that it will all disappear and you realize that in a way it's all unmade. It isn't, it's, it's all, it never was made. That's, you know, there are two answers to the question that we always bring up that human beings are, what the hell, where did it all come from? What's the beginning? You know, and there's two answers to it. One, it comes from ignorance. The main one is it comes from ignorance or unknowing, misknowing, wrong knowledge or not knowing. And what that means is that if you have wisdom, you realize it didn't come from anything. And then in a relative way, they'll sometimes say it's beginningless simply, and then the mind kind of goes back and thinks, well, it's always been going on, that's all. But actually, the higher reason is it's not happening at all. That's the shock. It's not happening at all. And the awareness that it's, the deep visceral awareness that it's not happening at all is ecstasy, actually. And also, and, and it's a real, that's why nirvana is a great thing. I, I know it's way jumping ahead, but I might as well tell you, looking at all so baffled. Nirvana is really great because when you attain it, or at least this, I don't know, I may be wrong actually, but this is what I think is why it cheers me up a lot, so I'll share it with you. When you realize nirvana, it's something that you always knew is what you realize. It's like those kind of things that you learn sometimes. Have you ever, you've, you've had things, you've learned something, and when you, oh, I always knew that, you think, right? Oh, I knew that. I just wasn't paying attention to my knowledge of it. And I was thinking something else. But I knew that. You know, it's like an intuitive thing. Oh, I knew that. You, always, you think that. Have you had that experience? So the ultimate experience like that is nirvana. Bliss. It's like, and the only way you can know it is through bliss. And what is bliss? Bliss is melting. And when you have an experience of going beyond boundary and merging with everything, that's bliss. So that's in a way knowing by becoming. Anyway, I won't do too much on that, but, but that's important to know because knowledge of the uncreated, knowledge of the unborn, that's true wisdom. In the transcendent wisdom sutras, the Buddha, well, this is empty, that is empty. You know, the heart sutra that everybody knows, all of you, a lot of you who know Buddhism, you know, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no this, no that. And that doesn't mean that you don't have your nose, but it means that you don't have a real nose. Like my old Lama used to say, my old Mongolian Lama, he used to say, people are not wrong that they, they exist and that they're real. People are real. But the problem is people think they're really real. And that's where the exaggeration comes in. When you, you have a nose, everybody, I like to say, it's your lifelong hood ornament. <laughs> Cars used to have them. You, know? you go around with your nose. But if you try to really pinpoint your nose, you cannot find your nose. You try to find your nose. People go like that. He, ah, he did that down. People go like that. Okay, but then is that your nose? If you went down plastic surgery and you didn't like your nose, like poor Michael Jackson or something, they can take that off that you're touching. That's a piece of something. Conventionally, it's the nose, but and anyway, what's it? The finger that you touch, if you press, or it's a bigger space or a smaller space. If you took a little pin and you touch something, it would be touch a tiny little point. But anything, anything that you touch on the nose that is there when you don't look for it is not your nose. And besides, where is the boundary between nose and cheek? Here. Between nose and air in the nostril, where's the boundary? Where's the boundary between nose and brow? There is no boundary. There's no thing that's, that you cannot 
every, the nose is made up of many different things, none of which are the nose. And then the, is the nose the assemblage of all those things? Well, well, sort of, but in a way of sort of really pinning it down, no, because you can't say whether this piece of skin here is nose or cheek. So there's no boundary, actually, to the nose. And then if you look at, the, if you look at one of those, those frightening you know, cosmetic commercials, that a microscope thing about the skin of the nose looks like the Grand Canyon. And where, where one pore looks like the Grand Canyon, and where is the nose part? You know, is, it just a, is there a plane or a line? And then if there's a line, line has no width. You know, line is an abstraction. If there's a point that you touch and say, this point is on my nose, but a point is not on your nose because the point has no side. Right? Point is an abstraction. So you can, your nose can, you can have a thought experiment where your nose will dissolve under analysis. And then if you can take that thought experiment and if you had one point in this of mind to having developed meditative power of ability to concentrate to a deep degree, you would actually, your nose would actually, your hood ornament would disappear. And that is incredibly liberating, in fact. Then as you grow older and your nose starts to sag a little, you're not really bothered. <laughs> it wasn't really my nose, you know. It was just my nose. It's just a nose. You know. Whatever. Moved by compassion. And then Buddha has aware that things are uncreated. He has realized beginningless nirvana. He has realized that this wandering is based just on a confusion. It's someone who doesn't know where they are. Where they really are is in a realm of absolute freedom. The word freedom, for example, you don't feel scary. If I say freedom, you, everybody, hey, George Bush even likes it. Freedom. But freedom is a negation. Salt-free, sugar-free, trouble-free, it's negation. Freedom, therefore, is like, well, freedom from what, you have to say? Freedom. Freedom from freedom means what, you know? A double negation. Hundreds of reasons and technical procedures. So now what the Buddha is saying here, which is kind of interesting. Now, this fact of the uncreatedness, you know, no eye, no ear, no nose, one of the big misunderstandings of Buddha's thought, which must be corrected to really enter into the essence of true eloquence with effort, is that since concepts cannot capture reality, they are all completely useless. And therefore, meditation is obliterating your conceptual thinking and even any thinking and having an empty mind and you know that then as people assume that in like the Zen centers, people are staring at the wall to try not to think anything. And you know that don't think anything and then you're fine. But this is really a mistaken. The, the, the Zen person, well in, in one branch of Japanese Zen anyway, they have these kind of puzzles, these koans, these, these public cases, which koan means like a legal case actually, originally, going on. And it's, a, it's something you're looking for the right solution of a puzzle, generating a huge doubt by thinking critically about the situation. And then that doubt kind of explodes a superficial level of thinking and gets you to a deeper and deeper level. And then the thinking, it, in a way, it negates both sides of the riddle. And then you merge with the whole situation. And then you do understand it by merging with it, sort of. So that's what you do. And then you do go beyond concept. But you don't go beyond concept by saying, initially, I'm just going to suppress my conceptual thinking. Because if you simply suppress your conceptual thinking, you just suppress your awareness of your ignorance, but it's still there. You don't get into the unconscious level of your ignorance at all. You just suppress its surface manifestation. And you can tranquil, and it's, very, it's a little bit dangerous because you can tranquilize yourself, and you become what they call quietist. And it, you get what in the Zen tradition is called, you get trapped in the demon ghost cave where you think you, when you don't think that you're in emptiness. And because you're not thinking anything, you're free. And then you, and then what you are is the victim of your, that's why they call it demon, you're a victim of your impulses. Aggressive impulses, or greed impulses, or envious ones, or proud ones, or just plain depressed ones, confused ones. You follow. And you no longer have the analytic, self-analytical equipment mentally to go into yourself and see how it works, and, and, un, you know, and, and dismantle the mechanism of your ignorance, of your unconscious ignorance, you follow me. 
So this has been a, a lot of people have had this terrible misunderstanding. But that's why he says, he introduces them to reality, the reality of the way, of the way of ultimate reality, of, of emptiness, voidness, transcendence, with hundreds of reasons and technical procedures. The reasons have to do with your, the word vipassana, everyone talks about vipassana. You know, we, we have the Burmese tradition of vipassana. But vipassana, even in, the, in any tradition, Burmese or Tibetan or anything, the V part has to do with dualism. It means dividing, by, like bi in, in English, you know, bifurcation, bivalent, you know, ambivalent, you know, bicycle, right? That's V part. And pasyana means seeing. So it means divi dividingly seeing, which means analytically seeing. Vipassana. So when you bring mindfulness, for example, you're looking at the things that rise in your mind and you're picking out this thought from that thought and you're constantly deciding to let that thought go and you're finding a deeper thought of I want to concentrate. And then if you continue more with Vipassana, and then they say they tell you to be non-judgmental, but that's only at the beginning so that you won't be in denial of things that you're thinking. You won't be afraid of the fact that you might be thinking some real hostility thing. You might be having a fantasy about strangling your beloved or whatever. You know, you, you, you know, you then be so frightened that you don't want to look in your mind. So then they say non-judgmental so that you see all this, that everybody's full of every kind of thought. But then once you see that, then the Vipassana has you critic, critic, critique the thought that wants to strangle your loved one and say, wait, that's ridiculous. They're perfectly nice. I like them. They're nice to me. I, they're helpful. They're beautiful. And then you stop wanting to strangle them. And you, you diminish that. You, do, you diminish that kind of hostility. You, know? so you turn that. You become free of that kind of drive, aggressive drive, something, defensive drive. You follow me? So that's what vipassana actually means. And the ultimate vipassana is where you look into yourself and you see through yourself. Your masks about I have this identity and I have this persona and this is me, and that is me. You realize that you have you are a constant process and you are a work in process and you are some you are a piece of creativity and you're creating yourself at all time or you're degenerating at all time. If you if you let yourself go to just be created by your impulses, which you you become such a therefore, you know. Dharma teachers who tell their students don't think anything, as you notice, often end up exploiting them and then the students become helpless and don't know what to do. And they go, duh, you know. Oh, I'm enlightened now, so what shall, shall I go pee now, Guruji? You know? and, then, and then often then they can't resist the temptation to exploit them, those gurus. So that's, that's Buddhism was, is not to be taught that way. Buddhism is to intensify the intelligence. Your salvation, Buddha's insight was, his teaching to human beings was, you are really valuable and I'm really making a fuss about teaching you human beings because you have intelligence. And with that intelligence, and especially self-critical intelligence, and other critical intelligence, and reality critical intelligence, you can discover what is real and distinguish it from what is unreal. And when you discover the really real, you'll find out that it's freedom and, and you will find it out with bliss and you'll be happy. It's, so it's your intelligence that helps you find freedom, in other words. So then if you, if you understand that path, of, that path of reasoning, you'll see why he quotes this verse with approval here and what the, what the essence of true eloquence is about. And the eloquence, the true eloquence, of course, means, means you know, like my first uh, publishing of this translation and the study of it, I called it uh, Speech of Gold. And I was playing on the thing we have in English about, you know, eloquence is silver, but silence is golden, you know, something like that, which is a great, good expression. But there's a kind of non-dual expression that is golden as well. You know. the si there's a good silence and a bad silence. For example, in the Vimalakirti Sutra, there's two silences. I always ask my students, none of you are going to take my college course so I can give away an exam question <laughs> without fear. And there's one silence where the head monk is asked by a goddess, who is transcendent wisdom herself, how long has he been enlightened? Because he asks her, like, how long have you been so amazing? Because she's been talking circles around him, sort of thing. And then she says, well, well, he, sa he says, 
She says to him, how long have you been in nirvana, she asks him. And then he's silent. And then she says, well, Reverend Shariputra, you, now you're, it's your turn to answer this question. Why are you maintaining silence when I ask the question? It's your turn to, you're supposed to be the wisest person in the community. You're the head monk. How come you can't answer the question? He said, well, I, I didn't want to answer because I, you can't really say anything about nirvana. So she said, oh, Reverend Shariputra, do not think you can point to the ultimate or to nirvana by abandoning speech. Nirvana is neither inside nor outside nor anywhere in between. And similarly, speech is neither inside nor outside nor anywhere in between. The very nature of speech is nirvana, she says. It really freaks him out in that one. But then there's a later context where Vimalakirti is asked, what is the entrance into non-duality? After 32 other people have given their descriptions of non-duality, conceptual dualistic descriptions, non-duality, and the guy just before him said, any description is dualistic, so you made a mistake making any description. And then he said, what do you think? Then he was silent in that context. And then that was considered a liberating silence. So I asked, always asked the students, what's the difference between the two silences? But don't worry, I'm not going to give you a quiz. <laughs> mm. Shariputra thought he had he had a nirvana, you know, and then he thought you, it was something transcendent, so he couldn't point to it, but he was still holding on to it as something separate from everything else. So he was using silence. His silence was expressing a hopelessness about other people's ability to understand their own nirvana because he's dualistically thinking he had it and they didn't. Whereas Vimalakirti, in the context of that questioning, he, he, he saw everyone else as in nirvana. So his silence was, since you have nirvana yourself, you don't need to be told. It's like the Brahminical thing of that art thou, you know, you are Brahma, you know. Except if you're Brahma, why does someone need to tell you? Type of thing. Anyway, never mind. Having extreme, seen the extreme difficulty, this, this is still a prologue, of realizing the actuality of things without which there is no liberation from the world, the compassionate teacher introduced living beings to that realization through the many doors of reasoning and technical procedures. It's just he's really repeating in prose the same thing. Thus the discriminating should exert themselves in the techniques for realizing thatness. This depends on the discrimination between the interpretable meaning and the definitive meaning of the teachings of the victor. And the victor is a, is a name for, for Buddha. One of the, victor over ignorance, that means. You know, he won the battle with the, with the demon of ignorance. Now, here is a very key point. It is not possible to discriminate between these two on textual authority alone. On some statement in a Buddhist sutra or scripture, such as, this is interpretable meaning and this is definitive meaning. Otherwise, the champions, by the champions he means Nagarjuna and Asanga, two of the great, like Aristotle and Plato, you know, type of thing, the, of, the, of the Indian tradition. Uh, the, the champion's elaboration of explanations of the problem of discrimination between interpretable and definitive would have been pointless. Further, many different interpretations of interpretable and definitive have been declared in the sutras themselves. And finally, since it cannot be established in general by referring to scriptural statements alone, as no such statement would be valid in every case. Neither can it be established by a mere scriptural statement in any particular case. So what that means is scriptural literalism is out. You know, people do this in Buddhism. They say, oh, the Lotus Sutra said this, and so that's what it is. Or the Pali Sutra said that, so that's what it is. Or, and then even people will later get on and say, well, Tsongkhapa said this, or Padmasambhava said that, or or, you know, Nagarjuna said the other, or something. You know, they get into this kind of thing. And they'll try to make somebody, some authoritative statement be the decider. But he's saying no, because Buddha's teaching was so sophistic, so much more sophisticated. And he, he was a real Socratic, the Socratic method. You know, the Socratic method is that you dialogue with the student. You don't have one dogma for everybody. Different people need different things. Some people have to be talked to, you talk, he teaches selflessness to some people. He teaches self to some people who are too nihilistic. 
selflessness to people who are too absolutistic, for example, which seem to be contradictory, but therefore statements are always contextual. So, so that's, that's, a, but that's a big step. Not all Buddhists will agree with this, actually. Some will say, well, the Lotus Sutra is the real scripture that the Buddha taught, and whatever he says there, that's the thing. And Lotus Sutra, you know, contradicts the Four Noble Truths, for example. He says, there is no suffering. Everything is my body, Buddha says in Lotus Sutra. He has a revelation of, there is no death. The whole universe is perfect. <laughs> he has a, it's a kind of beautiful, very positive, what they call cataphatic teaching, opposite from all unenlightened life is suffering. The champions of philosophy, that is, that is Nagarjuna and Asanga, and their followers, foretold to discern the interpretable and the definitive in the teachings, elucidated their inner meaning. Hence, we must seek that meaning by following their determinations established by reasonings that fault alternative interpretations of definitive meanings, sutras, proving their definiteness as uninterpretable meaning. Thus, ultimately, we must discriminate with impeccable reasoning. So this is the scientific, this is the foundation of the Buddhist science, actually. It's not just, I mean, science is philosophy, by the way. I don't know if you know, if you all agree with that. The, the scientists don't. They're totally untrained in philosophy. And they think that philosophy ended when they discovered that the real reality was matter. The only thing that matters is matter. And there's no mind and no soul. When they discovered that, they think they discovered that. They, they, philosophy was then useless because you can't think your way to understand things. You only can measure. You need machines. You need to amplify the machine of your own brain because you are a robot. You're a biological robot. And, and so philosophy is over. That's what all philosophers say nowadays. I don't know if you know that. But it used to be that science, material science, was called natural philosophy. And the fact that th if somebody makes a decision that everything is only matter and we're going to reduce it to its primary constituents and then we will then learn how to control everything, you will never be sick again when we know your genome. They promised us that, didn't they, for a decade or so. Then they got the genome, and then, oh, well, wait, wait, it's a, oh, epigenetic expression of this and that gene. Uh oh Oh, but Angelina, you better hack them off because you have like a gene. And, oh. That's so silly, I think. I know, I don't have such, I mean, I'd hack my breast off for other reasons, but it's a boring breast anyway. But, but uh, really... <laughs> It's sad, you know, and so the, so the point is, I, I shouldn't get distracted. So, so the point is, it's a philosophical decision. Materialism is a philosophical decision, and idealism is a philosophical, and metaphysics is still alive, and the human being can understand. But this is Buddha's great challenge to every one of you, and this is Dongkhapa's challenge, and this is His Holiness's challenge when the, the real teacher of this comes. You can understand reality yourself. And not only that, but you have to. If you don't, you'll not be OK. There's nobody else can make you OK. They will not, give, they will not find the Enlightenment. You know, Hoffman LaRoche, uh, you know, will, Zoloff, the ultimate Zoloff, will not loft you into enlightenment. It will not. You have to, your understanding is what is going to save you from suffering. And you have that understanding. You can find, you can dig it out and by remove the shells and layers and, and folds of confusion that you have wrapped around your own understanding. But you have. That's what Buddha taught. That's why he was happy. He saw beings as free in their essence, if you will, essenceless essence, just to be safe. <laughs> and, and then he realized they could unravel the confusion that made them unaware of their true awareness. In other words, ignorance is covering an, an innate wisdom that beings have, human beings. And all animals actually have it. But the other animals don't have the equipment to take it off like the humans do. And the gods have a better equipment than the humans, actually. They're just too distracted with pleasure use it and they get and they have very long lives thousands and thousands of years and they and they think that they don't need to bother 
you know, they're postponing it. Tomorrow, I'll deal with it tomorrow that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in my jacuzzi for another thousand years. <laughs> Should we accept theory? So, so the basis of Buddhist science is that, is that uh, reality is beyond conceptual capture, and therefore no formula is going to capture it. And the definitive meaning is the one that cancels all of our self-delusions that our theory corresponds to reality and that we really are right and that they, this scripture or that sutra or that thing tells what it really is. And the theory of Einstein's mathematics, if I only knew the mathematics or if I had 11 strings in the string theory or whatever, then I'd really know what reality is. The, 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 no, that is all wrong. So I can understand it, but I won't understand it just by being able to repeat a formula or by having a concept. On the other hand, my theories and concepts lead me to the door of that experience, provide me with the motivation to open that door, help me to provide me with the motivation to develop the concentration to go through that door, and, and encourage me with the, with the way of controlling my terror when the door seems to maybe lead to an abyss of death or fear or destruction or loss, that I will not be such a thing. There is no way of being nothing. I will not fall into an abyss of nothingness because there is no such thing. And all of that is done with my intelligence. And only your intelligence can do that. So your intelligence will not work to capture it by a dualistic theory in a dogmatic manner, but your critical intelligence of removing yourself from being captured by all the theories that you are captured by, is, is the intelligence is what will relieve you from that. Isn't that fun? That's really science. Truly, if they, they got out of their materialism dogma, popper, you know, popperian thing, all laws of nature, supposed laws of nature, are hypotheses that are the best way of you know, like accounting for what experiential evidence we have, experimental or experiential. Experimental means experiential, same, that we have. But they're awaiting falsification by more experience and more experiment, which means direct experience, right? The on only we Westerners are scared of meditating, and therefore we, we, we are going to count our own mind's experience as valid only what we measure in some machine. Because we don't have minds, we're just mental brain robots. Really self-imprisoned, they've imprisoned themselves in this poor philosophy, this, this like simplistic metaphysic of materialism, which their own, and rebelled against Niels Bohr and Heisenberg and these guys, these quantum people who told them that the mind is part of it, and your mind is part of it, and you have to be responsible for your mind in 1926. And Einstein and them all freaked out and ran away to Princeton. They said, we'll find it with math. And they're still doing it up in Columbia. Oh, we're getting 11. Wait till we get to the 11th dimension. Then we'll, then we'll have something for you. Meanwhile, we'll make a lot of TV shows and make money writing books and getting tenure <laughs> and assuring you that you assuring you that, you're, that you don't have to really worry because you're just going to die and your problems will be solved when your robot no longer functions. Or join Walt Disney in the icebox out there in Hollywood and, have a, and hire them for like 100 grand to freeze you, cryogenically preserve you, and then later Ray Kurzweil will download your brain in a brand new robot. Really? Should we accept theories violating reasoning, their teacher could not become the personification of validating cognition. That's a, that is a, just a, you know, an epithet, you know, a, a, like a praise term for a Buddha. Uh, Pramana Bhutta it's called, meaning one who personifies Pramana, validating cognition. You know, you know evidential, scientific, validating uh, awareness. For even the ultimate reality of things includes means of proof through logically established reasoning. Seeing the ramifications of this, the Lord declared, this is one of his, his favorite verses. I know he's going to talk a lot about this verse. So 
but it's it's an old picture. It's just as a goldsmith gets his gold first testing by melting, cutting, and rubbing. Sages accept my teaching after full examination, and not just out of devotion to me. So that was a really cool thing. Buddha, I love Buddha. Really, I do really like Buddha. <laughs> no, he's he's like Eureka! I understand everything. Oh, don't believe that I said that. You have to think it through for yourself. And Unfortunately, my understanding cannot just be expressed in a simple formula. But if you put this and that method into, into your use, if you, do, if you deploy your intelligence of this or that, or this or that path of critique, of critical reasoning to free your mind, and you combine that critical reasoning with mental concentrative power that you develop, so you have a combination of one point and critical penetration, then you yourself will understand. And as you make progress with that, you'll begin to give me credibility. But don't just believe this just because I said it. And I also say different things to different people. Because some people, like sometimes his disciples are there, like one guy comes up to Buddha and says, well, is there a self after nirvana or not, or no self? And then Buddha didn't answer. And then the other disciples said, hey, man, what did you let out about selflessness to this guy? How come you didn't like let him into, the, into the, our slogan, you know, so everything is selfless? And he said, oh, that guy's very nihilistic. If I said selfless, he would think he was already there. Because he thinks he's, a, he's had a, a little bit of experience, like he disappeared. And he thinks that's a big thing. And he thinks he's, he's something because he had an experience of like not being there. I can't tell you how many embarrassed chuckles and chortles I used to get when I used to visit different Zen centers. They actually still invite me, but I'm too busy. I haven't been lately. But when I said, oh, you guys had great retreat, that session, you know, the uh, meeting, the meeting pickles, and we're sour and salty and plums and uh, zen and robes and 4 a.m. and everything, and then you had a moment and you weren't there. <laughs> but then next morning you were there again, and you had to cook, and then you worried about your car, and you had a flat tire in the parking lot, and <laughs> alimony payments. <laughs> and then boring, you're still here. And you're just expecting a permanent disappearance. <laughs> and then so the Chapman said, there's no permanent disappearance. That's not enlightenment. That's a fake thing. And somebody, oh, I realize emptiness, if I can do anything. People are, don't, that's a big danger. That's the demon ghost cave. OK, so, so that's the prologue. Any questions? Any questions? Anybody have a question? Yes. Did you explain how Buddhism uses this term dualism? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes and no. Up and down. <laughs> you know? You know, that's dualism. And you know, and and but that's valuable. You know, good and bad. We prefer the good. Poison or medicine. We prefer the medicine. And self and other, of course, is a little more difficult one. So since we are self-centered beings, then we think we are not all the other beings. And therefore, the sort of, the, the sort of existential situation of such an individual being, socially, there is no really individual being. I mean, if you look for yourself, you won't find it. But ultimately, but relatively speaking and socially speaking, we are individuals because we think we are different from collectives, right? So that particular dualism is very bad for us because you are one thing and the universe is other than you and you're just completely overwhelmed by it. You know, there's all these other people and they, you think you're important and they don't. And even they think they're important. Then they may have a theory that you're important. Oh, all individuals are important, you know. We, have, we think we're individualists here in America, which is a joke. We're, re we're ready to listen to Fox News any day, elect some idiots. You know, the Germans, great, oh, Kant, Hegel, Beethoven, and then they followed Hitler, and they couldn't, didn't have any breakfast, you know. And they were being oppressed by the British and others. And uh, so, because you know, you, between you versus everything, then you get a bigger group, and your nation versus everyone, and, or your religion versus everyone, or something. You know, you try to like expand your sense of self. So that's all dualism, all of those things. And 
What? No, there's there's two, there's 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 it's a little more. There is something called monism, and there are philosophical theories that you could say are monistic, saying that everything is kind of one. You know, it's like and a friend of mine used to say in the '60s used to say, hey, hey, "Eureka! I had a vision that the whole universe was a giant jar of Vaseline." <laughs> but that's that's only one side of it. Non-dualism is some middle way between dualism and, and monism. So it's more complicated. Because if it's all one from the beginning, then dualism is just a surface thing. And dualism is, is itself doesn't interrupt the oneness. So therefore, you can engage in dualism. That's why that goes round and round. That's why Vimalakirti in the Dharma door of non-dualism in the ninth chapter of, of my translation of Vimalakirti Sutra, you, he doesn't say anything at the end because you can just go round and round with dualistic thing trying to describe the non-dual. Emptiness, selflessness, signlessness, these things, all meaninglessness, wishlessness, activitylessness, these things all negate and in negation, they freedom, actually, a synonym of emptiness is freedom. And freedom negates any bond or connection. It, 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 those negations indicate transcendence. And luckily, they transcend the transcendence also, which re gives, re returns you to the world. Now, when you look at your own hand in front of your face, it's not, it's not essentially you. You can imagine having your hand cut off, you know, amputated if you were bitten by a deadly snake that there was no antidote for. You might even hack it off yourself. Or like that guy in the, whose hand was prisoned under a rock and he saw it off with a pen knife, right? Because otherwise he was going to die there. So in a way, the hand is not you. But in a way, a hand is you. Now, it's my hand. I feel it's my hand, right? Now imagine if you looked at another person and you felt they were as much you as your hand is you, knowing that in a way they are also not you. But yet you had, you complemented the feeling that we normally have of they're absolutely not me by they're both me and not me. That's more like non-dualism. I, I like to say enlightenment is a state of the ultimate tolerance of cognitive dissonance. Rather than, we tend to, we think enlightenment, see, we, we find cognitive dissonance strenuous, and we want to collapse it to one side or another. Oh, it's, it's all one, or it's absolutely not all one, or something like that. We want. And, uh, and we think, oh, awake and asleep. So then people who think they're going to be nothing at death, they enjoy sleeping. And they're sick of life after 15, 16 hours, or 48 hours of no sleep, and they just want to sleep. They don't care how many hundreds of thousands they're losing. They just want to sleep. And they think of it as the opposite of the stress of the you know, discrimination and staying and not running to this and not, to that, not going wrong and the other things. And so they imagine that death is sleep. You know, like Hamlet said, right? To sleep, perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub, right? For in that sleep of death, we have shuffled off this mortal coil. What dreams may come must give us pause, right? Isn't it something like that? I, thought, I can't remember. And, and so enlightenment is being asleep and awake at the same time, being self and other at the same time. And, uh, and it's therefore an unimaginable state, but we, there are analogies and metaphors for it. You've been deeply in love sometime in your life. You had, not only erotically, but maybe with your infant for a while, or maybe in some whatever, some, some platonic thing or something. And you felt this other was really the greatest thing of yourself. We've all had some. We've, in other words, expanded our sense of identification to being two people, or at least one other person, without completely not being ourself. But, we, but we're not paying attention to that. We were just identifying with the other. Then some people on teams identify with the whole team. You know, then the, those, those soldiers go berserk, right, when their buddy gets shot. You know, then they shoot the whole village or something. Cause they, it's like themselves, the buddy, right, the buddy system. So 
it's, it's hard to imagine that there is, uh, we can evolve to be a being who feels we are everyone. Every single being in the universe. They say that they define Buddhahood as a being that considers every being like a mother considers her only beloved child. Which they get all dewy-eyed when they say that. I think poor guy. Poor Buddha. Because look at what they're doing, all those naughty children. Crazy. So, but that's because they are, you know, that's, that's, but yet he's still, he, you don't become just all of them and then you couldn't contribute anything to them. So both you're all of them and yet you are someone who can help them by being different from them by seeing their own highest potential realized in them, but seeing that they are not realizing it, and then seeing what does it take to motivate them to want to realize it, and to, what capabilities do they need to get to realize it, and how can you lead them, teach them. That's why they say the greatest thing Buddhas do is teach. Of the, all the, Dzongkapa in his short essence of doctrine, he has a verse of all the deeds of, the, of enlightened beings, their speech is the most important. Therefore, the wise praise only praise enlightened beings for their speech. Because and what do we do when we speak? When we have a conversation, when you speak to me, you, your mind is shared. With, you share your mind with me when you speak to me. When I speak to you, I share my mind with you. So in a way, we have, when we listen to each other, we open our mind to the other, give them the privilege of, our, of entering our mind by saying something. Now, it's very imperfect. And, you, and words, don't, just like words, don't capture the pillar, they don't capture the apple, they don't capture the self. The nose, that what we say is not perfect. It doesn't share our innate experiences, our deeper experiences, our transverbal experiences. But they, they, they do some sharing. They, they help us in some way. So speech is really, like karma evolution, the three levels of evolution, physical, mental, and verbal. And the verbal evolution is really important. The, the, the four good and bad paths of verbal evolution, like lying versus telling the truth, is huge. The difference between that. Telling the truth means sharing what you can see about reality with the other person. Lying is trapping them in a false reality, and yourself goes in there with them. Right? And so it's isolating, and it's, it's bad for you. So, so, so dualism... Uh, it, it's not like dualism. There was one Chinese guy, Ji Zhang, who very cleverly did. He has duality and non-duality. Then neither duality or non-duality and both duality and non-duality. You know, they go on like that. Because duality keeps doing that. You know? It keeps on doing that. It doesn't stop. Like they say, we never say there's... The, the Asanga or Maitreya says in one verse in the... Um, universal vehicle discourse, ornament, or literature. He says, we never say there's one Buddha and we never say there are many Buddhas. It's not Pali Buddha or Mono Buddha. Because in the Dharmakaya, the reality body level, there's no difference between all Buddhas. They're all one. And also, all enlightened beings are one with all unenlightened beings. Because when you have that, when you become enlightened and have that reality body experience, you feel you are all other beings their bodies and minds. You feel everything, the pillar and the buildings and the planets, and it's all you. You feel that. Just like now I feel this is me, which must be something amazing. You know? On the other hand, each individual being that was a separate being, self-centered separate being, has the bliss of becoming this oneness in their own way. So the form body of a Buddha are, different, are unique. Each one is unique. And, they, and their context within which they find this complete oneness with others is unique, and they enjoy their oneness. Their own, their each one's bliss is unique. Actually, there's a great New Yorker cartoon recently. I don't know if you read the New Yorker. There's a guy who's panhandling in the street, and he's not that destitute looking, but he's pretty destitute. And he has a sign on his chest that says, I followed my bliss. Poor Joseph Campbell, if he saw that, he'd be freaked out. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so uh, you know, so the, the, and then the Buddhas, 
emanate, they say they can manifest different bodies. Whatever other beings need, they will manifest even in embodiment. That's why Buddhists can't understand the Christian doctrine of just the one son of the omnipotent deity. They, they just find that they can't get it. You know, they, how, can it <laughs> how can it be? I, I won't tell the story right now. <laughs> so, 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 but du so, so dualism, can, you know, there's beauty and ugliness, you know. So dualism is part of the world. The world, in reality, is nirvana. And then there's a way of, re there's a way of reacting and, and interacting with the world based on ignorance, which is filled with fear and pain and suffering and difficulty. But if we knew the true reality of it, then we can still react with duality blissfully and helpfully and use it critically to help others liberate themselves from only being stuck in the ignorant side. And that's possible. The reason I think that it's possible is because their deeper reality is all right, already all right. Actually, the one preacher I know gave a great sermon once called All Right Already. All right already. You know, we say that. You know? And he claimed that's Jesus is teaching that. You know, he was a, some kind of Baptist or something. Very good, nice preacher. And I really like that because that is nirvana. Nirvana... The Mahayana non-dualist vision is all right already. Nirvana is already here. When you realize it, you realize you always were there. And my, my, my understanding now, since I've been dwelling in that the last few years, of how Buddha was able to remember his infinite previous lives. Why don't we remember our previous lives? Because they were painful. And when we die, it's, when you die and you try to clutch onto your life, it's painful. Like you're losing most important thing to yourself. And it's horrible pain. And so we forget it. We forget pain. I broke a foot, you broke, I broke a bone, you broke things. You, you don't remember that, what a pain it was, right? Burns. We don't really remember. It's a, so it's a positive thing, actually. <laughs> but when Buddha was on the brink of nirvana, under the tree, he was realizing he'd always been in nirvana. So even when he was in a hell or something, it was just confusion of feeling super isolated from other things and having them press on him in some crushing manner. And really, that was just bliss too. So therefore, he was able to remember everything. It, was, it just became open book to him, his infinite biological history. It, he, he, because we all, have, we all remember everything. It's all there. Not just in the brain, either. Brain is, when, when you die, according to the Book of the Dead, you are nine times more intelligent immediately. So your pattern, in other words, your pattern, your storage, your, your vastness of your awareness is kind of tamp, dampened down by the, the, the brain, especially our elder brain has plaque in it. But, 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 in, but even ordinary brain, the, the, the human being is much bigger than their brain, actually from Buddhist point of view. And, and they tell you, when you go to your own funeral in your early dreamlike you know, between state thing, and you can automatically read the minds of everybody at your funeral. And you know, Uncle so and so is like going, Oh, poor so and so, he's left, so sorry. And then you can read his mind, he's thinking, Good riddance. Like, he's not there to bother me next Thanksgiving. You're like, well, you know. And don't be upset. In the book of the dead, it says, Don't be upset if you find the ambivalence in other people's minds. Because every, all, everybody has all these thoughts in their mind. Normally, they don't even aware of them. They're in denial about them. But everyone has like every kind of thought about everything. So you can immediately read that when you're when you're out of the body, because your brain is your your pattern of you of your history of your process is much bigger than your brain in a particular life. As amazing as that may seem. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm di digressing too much. So. Now, the, he begins in the first chapter. He's dealing, the first and second chapters deal with what is known as the Vijnanavada system, the, uh, the Buddhist idealist system, which is something like, not like Bishop Barclay, if you know Western philosophy, a subjective idealism. It's an intersubjective idealism. In other words, they say everything is mind, but they don't say everything is your mind only. Because there are other people with minds. So 
the universe is the universe. We structure our universe in our intersubjective mind field. But the mind is touching the deeper energy than the material course level. And actually, our minds create the field of our interaction, is this Vijnanavada view. And there are really no non mental objects. They come up with this idea. And this, I like this. I mean, this is not considered the highest idea. And Tsongkhapa, this book, is going to refute this idea in a way, some, but he's going to take a lot from it. And um, this, is the, this, this is the point where one moves from Theravada style, and there are other schools than the Theravada, but nowadays only Theravada left. In, Buddha, in ancient time, there were other what they call dualist Buddhist schools, and their dualism means the idea that the samsaric or the world of suffering is one thing, and nirvana is a different place. So when you attain nirvana, you go elsewhere. And the Buddha taught that to some people, uh, because those people were sort of realistic types. And if he'd said, well, really, you're in nirvana right now, they would like, give me a break. You know, I just broke my leg, or I lost my son, or like they, we were invaded by the Martians, or whatever. You know, I'm not going to, this, this, you don't tell me this is nirvana, or whatever. If, if this is nirvana, it's, who cares? You know, it's stupid. So there are some people who are like that. So then he told them, well, yeah, this is a really bad scene here, but you can get to a place of freedom from this. And then they imagine some sort of transcendent uh, like space of freedom. And then they seek that. And he lets them do that. And then, however, then Mahayana is where he critiques that idea. He says, wait, but the absolute, if it were other than the relative, then in the sense of an other place, it would then be relative to the relative. It wouldn't be the absolute. The absolute cannot relate to anything. So the absolute ultimate reality has to be all there is, in a way. So the relative, it has to be the relative, actually. You know, that's, which is non -dual, that's a non-dualist uh, teaching, which is a little more complicated. You know, we could, but, the, but that's the entry to it, you could say. That's a kind of entry to it. And, uh, so, but, and then, in that case, the, your freedom from suffering is not your personal thing only. Since, you, since you're already in nirvana, and you're already interconnected with many beings, and if you knew your own infinite past, you would know you were interconnected with every being, you cannot enjoy this is nirvana unless everyone enjoys this nirvana. So then you have to take up the bodhisattva idea that you have to help all beings become free of suffering. You have to fix the world, so to speak, right? And it's easier to make such a heroic, messianic resolution if you think the world is this more diaphanous, mutable stuff. Mind stuff, because you know you you can you know how radical mind can change. You kind of have a feeling of the world, like vast oceans and mountains and continents and planets and galaxies and whatever. How can anybody change that? You know, that's the vast material thing. Seems the external object, what they call, seems hopeless. That thing. So I so it's the way I think personally. It's the entrance. They call it a sangha who was the Maitreya, the future Buddha, and a sangha the great champion of the mind-only philosophy. Uh, I think they were really opening the door for a lot of people to develop this heroic bodhisattva attitude. And that philosophical metaphysic, that it's, that it's in a way, mentalistic reductionism, gave people the courage to change the universe. To, to take up the goal of changing the universe, which of course is not as crazy as it seems to materialists. You know, if you have a messianic, I think in probably in the diagnosis book of the psychiatrist, a messianic complex is a disease, right? And someone says, I'm going to save the world. They say, okay, well, over there in Bellevue, on the, in the next ward, you're going to have Jesus and Napoleon and 
Muhammad, they'll all be there, so you go and join them, and then we'll give you some Prozac and some lithium and Librium, and you'll be cool. And uh, so you, you, it's some dementia, because who can change the world when you don't need to bother? You just die and you'll be nothing anyway. And the world is essentially nothing, and it's this accident, random mutation, and we're all running around thinking we're existing, and it's just silly, because reality, which has been discovered by MIT, that we don't exist. <laughs> and it's all nothing, ultimately. It's real reality is nothing. There, there is the absolute is nothingness for the materialist. And they rejoin that absolute by dying. Completely incoherent and irrational and psychotic idea of what they do. This idea that nirvana is elsewhere and yet it's the absolute is it catering to that psychosis, actually. But it's kind of making it like, well, I'll get there and I'll be, I'll be selfless and I'll be free. And in the process of doing that, then you get free from your inner drives and compulsions. And then you become more capable of contemplating the idea of being in freedom with everybody else and therefore being responsible for them all. And then the idea of compassion comes out of it. You follow? That's a Mahayana kind of view. Okay, anyway, so the first two chapters, he's expounding this Vijnanavada view, and he's going to a sutra which is called the Elucidation of the Intention Sutra, which is a very important one, for Asanga. And he quotes it, Paramartha Samudgata, this name even of the person of the sutra, Paramartha means the ultimate reality, and Samudgata means who has uprisen, who has arisen into ultimate reality or from ultimate reality could be either way. It's a compound in Sanskrit. You can analyze the compound in either way. But that's the name of the main interlocutor in this sutra, Paramartha Samudgata. Anyway, he states in the Elucidation of Intention Sutra, he's speaking to Buddha. He says, the Lord proclaims in many discourses the intrinsic identity of the aggregates their characteristics of production and destruction, their abandonment, and et cetera. It goes on, all the things. You know, he talks about things as if they were intrinsically identifiably present. Now, intrinsic identity is a very, I took out a footnote I had here, but it means selection are literally one's intrinsic mark, almost, or marking, intrinsic identity. And it, it's a concept you know, I don't know if you've studied, enough, if anybody here is a big student of philosophy, but you know, from the time of Wittgenstein, there's something that happened in Western philosophy, they call it the linguistic turn. There's someone in French guy called Saussure, who was a linguist, and the idea that language is creating the categories of philosophical thought, and it's part of the sort of idea that metaphysics is useless, that they wrongly and holistically misinterpreted it. But the linguistic turn is very good because it's, in philosophy, metaphysics, because it's realizing the power of language in constructing our realities. And so, you know, since Wittgenstein and, uh, and that Saussure guy and uh, some of the French people who were, you know, De Derrida was a big one who did subsequently to Wittgenstein. And, uh, but the Buddhists did that thousands of years ago. You know, and that words, that our reality is structured by words. And intrinsic identity is essential to that because Intrinsic identity means that my word for table, that there's something in the table, that my word table that seems to identify it as a table, lands on. It's something like another synonym for it could be intrinsic referentiality. That th th as a referent, you know, you say the, the term book, the referent of the term book is book. But there's something in the book that is intrinsic to the book that makes book land on it. And Wittgenstein is great on that. And he, he, that's why I use Wittgenstein in my study of this, top of this book, because Wittgenstein says, metaphysicians over the centuries, they, 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 they want to get the end, they sort of, they look at a book and they go, book! <laughs> and they, they, he has this great thing in, in, in philosophical investigation, he says, and as if they were giving, conferring an inner baptism on the object by looking at it and going, book! <laughs> and you know, Socrates, you know, Plato thought that what makes a book a book is the pure form in some sort of like conceptual heaven of bookness and that this book instantiates in a particular the, the universal, immortal universal of bookness. And in a really naive level it gets connected to different, in different cultures of the actual words in the different language. And therefore when people had like horrible crusades and things like 
God, you know, Jehovah is not Allah. You know, you can't call him Allah, then I'm going to kill you. Because his name is Jehovah or it's God. Or, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, it's the like, this is not a mesa. This is a table. You know, and if they say chokze in some other language, what are they talking about? There's no intrinsic chokze hood in here. Chokze is Tibetan for table. It's like a Chinese word. So intrinsic identity is a very important level. There's intrinsic reality. There's intrinsic objectivity. And there's intrinsic identity. Those are three sort of three levels of philosophical sophistication getting greater and greater. Intrinsic reality is the more superficial one, where you think something is real uh, because it's sort of what, what they call an ontology. You know, you think that it's really a pillar. It has, and its reality as a pillar is intrinsic to it. Its reality as a pillar is not that it's standing on a floor, that it's made of concrete, has reinforcing rod, that it's holding up the roof. You know, that it's a completely contextual thing. And also it's arbitrary. The pillar and the base of the pillar and the floor under it and the roots of the pillar, you know, we stop only and say pillars from floor up and from ceiling down. You know, it's like, you know, it's all very arbitrary. But intrinsic reality means that it has something inside itself that's pillarness about it. It's that phrase I think I used last time, massive facticity as a pillar. And even the idealists say that as a mental object, although it's, so, so it's, a, it's, a, so it's a notion in the mind that creates the perception of pillar, but, but uh, that's a real notion in the mind. It's intrinsically identifiably a pillar. It's intrinsically objectively a pillar. It's intrinsically really a pillar. Then intrinsic objectivity is on an epistemological level, a level of knowledge. My sense of it being a pillar as an object, there's an object, a massive objectivity in it. And then, the, then the, the identity is that my ability to say pillar to it lands on an intrinsic referent of my term, pil my concept and term pillar. That's its intrinsic identity. And that's more subtle, because that's already a conceding power to langu of language to give us the concepts of which we perceive things. And it's not just a Buddhist idea. You know Shelley or Keats or somebody, I always mix up which one of them, said poets are the unacknowledged legislators of mankind. One of them said that. And what they meant by that was that a poet sees something beyond the given categories of a culture at a certain moment and, and, and poetically expresses that. And then people kind of get that. And they see that flower that way, or that dew drop that way, or that ocean that way, or whatever it is. And then, then that term that was kind of a breakthrough of a deeper subtlety of seeing it that the poet did, then that becomes part of your conceptual dictionary. And then you can see things that way. So they're legislating how you perceive things, in other words, is what they meant by that. Right? And, uh, and so there they're aware that language is creating things, and that's what I'm saying. Dependence what? Dependence origination. Dependent designation. Yeah, dependent, that's right. Yeah, dependent origination as dependent designation. Correct, correct. So anyway. What he's saying is, you talk about all these things as if they were intrinsically identifiable. He says, oh, Buddha, you do. But now, then you also say that intrinsically they're unreal, they're not produced, they're not ceased, they're primordially peaceful, they're naturally and totally liberated. So I wonder about this and earnestly inquire of Lord Buddha, what do you mean when you say, and he speaks his because he's being sort of honorific, you proclaim intrinsic unreality, non-production, non-cessation, primordial peace, and natural total liberation of all things. Because these are two contradictory statements about things. So what do you mean? And here, now Nagarjuna, who we can later come, you know, the Madhyamakas, the centrists, they say, well, Buddha is not saying that they have intrinsic identity as, you know, um, suffering and, and release and production and destruction and abandonment, and et cetera, and aggregates and foods and elements and originations and remedies, resistances, et cetera. He's not saying they're intrinsically identifiable. He's saying they, they're relatively there. And when he says they're unreal, he's talking about their intrinsic nature, their ultimate nature, in other words. 
So they just have a duality. They, they have the two realities to deal with these, this, to reconcile this contradiction in the Buddha's thing. But Asanga doesn't like that, and Maitreya. And he says, he has Buddha say in this sutra, and Buddha himself doesn't like that. He says, I teach the intrinsic unreality of all things, intending the following three types of such unreality. Identity unreality, production unreality, and ultimate unreality. So you know, in other words, my unrealities have three different things. And, and uh, basically what he does is he says, things are intrinsically identifiable relatively, and they're ultimately intrinsically identifiable, but conceptually, they are not. So when I say they're unreal, that is, they're unreal in regard to corresponding to your concepts. But in some sort of ineffable relativity, they are real, identifiable. And of course, the ultimate and the relative are the same thing, really. So he adds a third dimension to it, the dimension of conceptuality. Rather than just relative and ultimate, he has relative, ultimate, and then conceptual relative. And conceptual relative is the one that his negations are pertaining to, he says. OK? Now, I think because of the time, and also I wanted to get through this today, so I can come to Madhyamaka uh, in this second class. Now, I'm jumping a little bit ahead to page, uh, mm, yeah, page uh, six and seven. And he says here, and then they, this connects, in the sutra, it's connected to sort of history of the Buddha's life. So first of all, the Lord in the deer park at Rishipatana in Varanasi, bottom of page six. This is from the Elucidation of Intention Sutra. For the sake of those involved in the disciple vehicle, that's the Theravada, you know, Pali, nowadays Burmese, Sri Lanka, Thai, uh, Cambodian. Uh, and Tibetan, and actually the Mahayana countries too, but not, it's not exclusively in the Mahayana countries. It's the monastic, I call it monastic Buddhism, and, or I call it, I never call it lesser vehicle Buddhism, or I call it monastic Buddhism, or individual vehicle Buddhism. It's Buddhism where it only seeks, where the individual practitioner seeks his own or her own liberation, and that doesn't get into this idea of I'm going to liberate all beings from suffering. I'm just going to become an arhat, a saint, and liberate myself. Not because I have anything, it's not that I don't care about other people, it's just that I don't think I have the ability to liberate them. They have to do themselves, if you follow me. So I call it individual vehicle versus universal vehicle. And the universal vehicle needs the individual vehicle because each one has to do themselves in a way. It's just the universal vehicle wants to help them more than the people for the individual vehicle think they can, or they would want to if they thought they could. So anyway, so for their sake, turned a wondrous, amazing wheel of dharma. And the wheel of dharma is a metaphor for the way a Buddha teaches. Because a Buddha doesn't teach because he's trying to get something out of a teaching. He's just actually reacting to the need of beings. It's like a water wheel. The river flows and then the wheel turns and turns the water into irrigation or something. Turns the, the wheel of the desire and the need of the beings into a teaching and a liberating teaching for them to become free and to find their liberation. Anyway, Wheel of Dharma, such as had never before been turned in the world by humans or gods, by showing the aspects of the four holy truths. Nevertheless, even in that Wheel of Dharma turned by the Lord was, even, even that Wheel of the Dharma Lord was surpassable, provisory, interpretable in meaning, and disputable. So, why? Because in that one, in the first one, the Four Noble Truth Wheel, the Buddha left intact in his listener the realistic idea, a philosophically realistic idea that there's a real samsara here and there's a real nirvana somewhere else. And there's a real something in the table, an intrinsic identity, and, and, and there and is a real thing about my relative self, and my relative self is suffering from some real suffering, and then it will be really, it'll have some real freedom from the real suffering. So he was teaching the reality of things, in a way, was he emphasizing. But yet, within that reality, he was, what was revolutionary was he was telling beings, you can really free yourself from suffering. And you can do so by understanding the cause, second noble truth, which is the cause of the first one, which is your suffering. 
you can first of all get out of denial about your suffering, then you can understand the cause of it, then you can terminate the cause of it and be really free of it. So that's a revolutionary. Even today it's revolutionary. Your shrink will not tell you you can become permanently free of suffering in your human lifespan if you really evolve. You can just maybe be less neurotic, but you're good at Freud said, you can, you're still going to suffer. But these people claim you, they, you don't have to wait for God to free you from suffering. You're not going to do it by just dying and being nothing, which, will maybe, which is a kind of freedom from suffering. You can, you're never going to get out of it unless you understand that it is freedom from suffering. So that's revolutionary in a sense, but it's surpassable, provisory, interpretable, meaning, and disputable. So then he taught, then for the sake of those involved in the universal vehicle, who are capable of taking the burden of their responsibility and connection to all beings on their shoulders, he turned a second wheel of dharma, even more wondrous and amazing, by proclaiming emptiness. Selflessness, that means emptiness, starting from the fact of the unreality, productionlessness, ceaselessness, primordial peace, and natural liberation of all things. So this second one is the prajnaparamita wheel of teaching. You know, no eye, no ear, no nose, no suffering, no non-suffering, no this, no that, no Buddha, no dharma, no sangha, no... On a, no enlightenment and no non-enlightenment either, he even says. <laughs> and uh, so in the later theory that, that, this, that Tsongkhapa and Nagarjuna is going to espouse, the second one is the definitive one. But in this sutra, the second one is still not definitive. So it's the first wheel of Dharma is the wheel of everything is real, it really exists, including freedom from suffering and including suffering. They're both real. The second wheel of Dharma, it's all unreal, both suffering and freedom from suffering. But the third one is some of it is real and some of it is unreal. And in this sutra, they say that's the one that's definitive because it's more discriminating. So he says here, nevertheless, even this wheel of Dharma, that's Pranaparamita, it's all no, 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 and everything's unreal, was surpassable, provisory, interpretable, and disputable. Then the Lord, for the sake of those involved in all vehicles, turned the third wheel of Dharma using the finest discrimination, starting from the fact of the unreality, productionlessness, ceaselessness, and primordial peace and natural liberation of all things. And this turning of the wheel of Dharma by the Lord is unsurpassed, not provides any definitive meaning, and leaves no grounds for dispute. So, so, so it's, it's both a, this hermeneutic, which you, which you call it, Hermeneutic means a theory of interpretation. You know, Hermes is, you know, the god of communication, right? Hermeneutic. So this theory of interpretation is both a critical one in that it has a philosophical reasoning behind it, an idealistic philosophical reasoning behind it, and it's a historical one in that it says that Buddha sort of bounced back and forth. First he said everything is real, then he said everything is unreal, then he said with fine discrimination, this part is real, this part is unreal. Okay, and for the Vinya and then for the Vinyanavadin. Now, from the Vinyanavadin, the unreal part is the conceptualization, and the relative, inexpressible relativity is because they they consider themselves non-dualists and doing a middle way, and they think that the Madhyamakas, the centrists, are too nihilistic. So they feel people will become, when they say it's all no, 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 then everyone will think it, then the nihilists will have a field day and they'll, people will be trapped in nihilism. And Asanga doesn't want that, so he puts a little bit of a safety underneath it. The, conceptual, the, the reality as conceptualized is unreal. In reality, it's relative. But the relative and the absolute together are that reality. So that relative has an ineffable intrinsic identity, if you will. It's a little bit like Kant, actually, but it's idealistic. It's like, as a relative thing, myself has an intrinsic identity as a relative self. Well, somebody would say, how can it be intrinsic if it's relative? Well, it's only relatively intrinsic. <laughs> but if I don't feel it's intrinsic, since I do feel that myself is really coming out of myself, there's some irreducible entity in there that's me. At least it's better if I think it's, it doesn't correspond to my rigid concept of myself. That's unreal. But an unconceptualizable, unverbalizable, ineffable 
intrinsically real me is here. That makes me feel safer. You follow me? And when that, when that intrinsically real relative self is free of any rigid conceptualization on top of it, then it is ultimate. And I'm blissful and it's all happy and it's all mind and there's no external objects and blah, blah, blah. So it's like putting in a safety in the middle, he feels. It, it actually, he elaborate this sutra is taught later on, maybe in Buddha's history, the Madhyamaka might reason that in Buddha's life, some of the followers of his, because remember, the, in Buddha's life, his whole Mahayana teaching was kind of esoteric. I know you maybe all know that, but he says in the Mahayana sutras, he says this thing about emptiness and objective selflessness and so on, which is objective selflessness. I don't want this, this is not going to spread widely in India for 400 years. After 400 years, someone with the Naga in his name will arise and will make it spread in India because it will be safe to do so. But I don't want, it's like not to be told to everybody for 400 years. Why? Because people need the dualism of there's a nirvana to escape to. They need the social dualism of there's the monastic order, there's a way of renouncing the worldly life and going to monastic order. We're not asking people in the household to find this realization because they have their duties in the household. But, they, but they're, they're, and they're specialists who create this alternative social reality. I, I like to call it the Swiss cheesification of Indian society, where he creates these, these asylums where people go and they become monks and nuns and they devote themselves to meditation and touch study and critical analysis and then they, they find a kind of freedom. And even once they get up to where they're getting to where they're launching off into this other nirvana, they get into this thing of where they think, oh, oh heck, but nirvana means selfless. So I'm not going to be my usual self just sitting out somewhere else enjoying nirvana. Nirvana is actually my being free of that rigid kind of self that I felt was in there. And so, hey, I'm still here, you know. The ones, so then they go about entering into the larger picture, you know, and Theravada, and then the, and thought in Theravada is the Bodhisattva thing of the Buddha and his former life as Bodhisattva, et cetera. So then there's all kind of subliminal cues about the fact that there is no permanent escape place. But he's luring them to do it in that, and he wants that in the society. He wants the kings to, to not be coercing everybody. He doesn't want the kings to come up with, oh, this is all non-dual, so I'm going to conquer the world and make everybody be a bodhisattva. And since they're all bodhisattvas, they'll just serve me, they'll do what I say. Because they're all selfless bodhisattvas, so I know what to do, and I'm going to beat up everybody who says I don't, and then I'm going to be a dictator. I'm going to be a Mahayana dictator. So he, did, he didn't want that Indian society, the king thing, the, the social thing, the caste system and the king thing was so strong in Indian society at that time that he didn't want them to latch on to a wrong idea of non-duality, a monistic idea of non-duality. And Western people absolutely don't agree with it. They don't, you know, the historians. Why? Because fundamentally they will not acknowledge that there is such a higher awareness of someone like a Buddha who can see what's going to happen in history who can predict what's going on. That's not possible. They're not going to do that. They won't even listen to their own scientists who tell them that in 50 years, Wall Street is going to be underwater. They won't listen to that. They're going to build a seawall. They're going to do all this stuff. You know? And so why would they... Why would they uh, uh, yeah. So they need, they need to create... He needed to create... There were no universities in Buddha's time. They were only apprenticeships. He had to do what his father did. The Brahmin children learn the Vedas and they do rituals like their father did. You know, there was no, the, the Vedas have no idea of liberation. There's no mention of the word moksha in the Vedas. None. Zero. You don't get liberated. It's just you're part of a wheel of society, of the caste system, of the, the gods and the humans and the ancestors and so on. So he wanted this dualism to create a space and a notion of transcendence. And he, like a sociologist, he, he planned it perfectly, actually. But, the way, but modern people, they're, they're, the people who study Buddhism, they're hell-bent. Their whole stake 
to keep things within the context of our culture, there is no higher awareness. Do you realize that? Yeah, that's a canon of our culture. Uh, your education, you were told that you cannot understand yourself. That's a canon of it. If you think you understand yourself, have some lithium. You've gone nuts. You're having an adolescent freak out. Adolescent megalomania. God understands this, if you're supposed to believe that, if you're in the church, or synagogue, or mosque, or whatever. And maybe and certain ways of telling Buddhism are, yeah, the Lama can understand, but you can't. So there are even Buddhist ways of acting like this. And the scientists also tell you you can't understand. They say, they understand a lot. They, they, and they always on the threshold of understanding everything. Once the gene is analyzed, once this is that, once they have more funding, they're going to get that cancer. They didn't understand it in 60 years. They made zero progress in cancer. And they poisoned the crap out of a lot of people. And now they're getting targeted. They're going to target it. And they get their gene. This and that. They're going to get it. Just, just give all your money to Sloan Kettering, and they'll, get, they'll save you. But never mind what you eat. He, eat powdered potatoes in Sloan Kettering. They're going to feed you like you know, Lancaster steak made on, on old antibiotic-injected hormone-seething meat. No. And you can't understand, so you have to go to their authority. And you, feed, you do when you get sick. You're a hippie and you're eating soy milk and like, like almond milk and like blueberries, shakes, and very no, and then you get sick and yes, doctor, give me the chemo. Cut my breast off. Cut it all off. Change my marrow, whatever. Because they're the high priest. But they're but the canon is you can't understand. And it's just they they a little more, they understand more how they don't understand but they understand enough to poison you and not save you from public health poison of the crappy food industry and the agriculture and the Monsanto and these people. They don't think that's part of their medical brief. These vast hospitals, Columbia Hospital, buying up hospitals, close St. Vincent. Let's not have any walk-in doctors anywhere. Right? Are you familiar with this? So, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, this is wrong. <laughs> so, you know, so, so, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. But the key thing here is, the key thing here is this. Look at the wall, look at the pillar. Now, you're looking at that pillar. Now, and you see the color white. White color, white paint. Now, the perception of the white and even of the pillar, there's, it's like, imagine you sort of just look like this. There's a moment where you don't know it's a pillar, you don't even know white. As they say in this kind of Buddhist psychology, you see white, but you don't see, quote, white, unquote. But it's so fast that we, when we look, we think we see, quote, white, unquote. You see, the whiteness is intrinsically identifiable as white. So there's an identity of white that immediately we read, we think that we're reading it off the pillar, off the color in the pillar, we think. So what presents itself to us is the white, the white painted pillar, then the quote white, quote painted, quote pillar. But they come together so fast that we have no moment of a open perception where we're not sure what it is. Because we immediately label and categorize it. The brain does, the mind does. Immediately sorts it out. Unless you're stoned, drunk, or something, you know? But it doesn't have to be stoned and psychedelic. It could be drunk, could be whatever, or you're, or you're fainting, or you're having a temporary moment. You, you have no, or sometimes, you know, you go to, you go to a museum and you see the, Van Gogh's crows, you know, in Provence, swirling around in the sunny harvest, you know, like sheaves of whatever, wheat. And if you, don't, you don't know what it is kind of at first. And then you sort it, your brain sorts it out. Oh, yeah, it's a bunch of crows in the field, and the guy's like ear was hurting him, and he chopped it off, and he's like getting, he's like, well, screwed up. And it's like, you think of the actor you saw in the movie on Van Gogh, and whatever. 
So your mind completely goes around and controls it, and then it's boring, isn't it? But sometimes you have aesthetic experiences where you somehow don't know what it is for a split moment, and you're open to it, right? And then a poem comes out, or then whatever it is. So what this Vinyanavadan thing is doing, the brilliant genius thing is, is they're helping us with this thing of the three levels of reality, the conceptual or imaginative level of reality, the relative level of reality, and the perfect level of reality, the absolute level of reality. And those three levels is helping us to separate the conceptual from the relative and begin to critically see in the appearance of the white the quote white unquote and realize that we're projecting that into the white. And if we combine that with a meditative, concentrative thing, we can begin to, it's like mindfulness, we can begin to say, we begin to see something without, without completely chopping it up with our conceptualization right away. Do you follow me? It's a slow peeling off, but it takes time. It takes critical effort, critical and contemplative critical effort. You know, the massive facticity of pillarness comes to our perception with the pillar. We project into that pillar a kind of strength and solidity that makes us feel secure that the roof isn't going to fall on our head. You know, we feel in control of the world around us because it fits with our concept. And that's why we're like, when we, if you're drunk, you get frightened. And actually, you shouldn't, of course, drive, and you might bang into the pillar, you know. If you're, if you're contemplative, you know, you, there's types of contemplation that you don't, you want to protect yourself. You don't want to run out in the street. You don't want to be on driving cars doing that. You don't want to be like deconstructing, <laughs> deconstructing the stop sign, you know, while you just want to hit the brakes. So, so, but in a protective thing, you know, stop, S. When you go to Russia, you see this weird symbol. And actually, they still say, I still haven't figured that out, the Russians. It still says stop. <laughs> it does. I don't know why they don't have a Russian word. It's got these funny letters. It's still stop <laughs> on the stop sign. And, and then you, you but the, the STOP that we see in English has a, it's like you're driving down the highway and you see like this and that commercial thing, and your mind automatically reads the slogan. You can't stop yourself. You see this, if I go like this, you see A, it seems to shout A at you. Then you, you can do a thought experiment. You can, I do that in Blackboard with my students. You take the A and you topple it over like this. And then when does it stop looking like an A? You know, when then you begin to realize that, oh, it's not in the shape. It's my mind, when, it's, when it seems to be receiving the projection of intrinsic identifiability from my mind, then, then it, it, it seems to be A by itself. And then the realization of signlessness is that there's no intrinsic sign of A in it. Right? San, you know, Sanskrit A doesn't look like our A. But when they see that, they can't help but it resonates A in their head. So this Vinyanavada thing, a key element of it is, is beginning to peel away the encapsulation. Because why? Our ignorance makes us think that the, what our concepts of things are really corresponding to them, and that is really the way the world is, and you're really other than me, and I'm other than you. And that's because your name is so-and-so. You're Tom. You're different. You're not me, and I'm not you. And, then, and then, you know, then people do this even in psychology, like marriage counseling things. They say, oh, the different people get into certain roles, and they always expect that person to behave like that. And they don't even see aspects of their being that is different from whatever they think they're supposed to be doing. So we entrap each other in our concepts of what the other one is. Don't we? We do. We always expect them to be like this or like that. You know? Because our concept that fits with it. And yet that's why we're so bored in life. We, seek, we go on roller coasters to get sort of a thrill, you know, where we can't control things. Yeah, you want to say something? Sure. Right. Well, I don't know. I mean, 
when you say, what if you've never seen a pillar before? But if you had read a book about pillars, you had some concept of pillars, of whatever, um, good question. You know? Or if you had a different word for it, it wouldn't be a pillar. In Gawa, in Tibetan, it's a Gawa, it's not a pillar, etc. So, I don't know. I mean, this is not, it's not like a theory that the word pillar makes it a pillar. But the word pillar makes us perceive it in a certain routinized way. Actually, emptiness means that the, the, the bottom line of emptiness is not only that there's an initial understanding of emptiness where that you see through the pillar. It disappears under analysis. It can for you. Just like, like the, you know, I told you about the physicist with the snowshoes. Last week? Did I? It's a joke, but it's about the, the physicist, the old senior emeritus physicist who has a pair of snowshoes in his lab. And when he comes to the lab, he puts them on and clomps around amongst the, amongst the equipment and the experiments. Finally, the graduate student says, well, professor, why do you clamp around here with your snowshoes? Sometimes you step on my toe when I'm doing an experiment. And he says, well, when I come in the lab, I, I'm realizing the atomic nature of things, the particle physics, and that it's most, the floor is mostly empty, my foot is mostly empty. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm increasing my chances of not falling down into the subway <laughs> or into the center of the earth. Because, you know, there, the, you know, he, that's, in his, his mind, it's not really a solid thing in the scientific level. But... Um, but then the thing is this, when, you have, when it has disappeared under analysis and then you have to have that experience and then it's back though because the disappearance disappears, then you can begin to realize that your imagination was routinized through your concept of a pillar to only see it one way and in a way you never notice anything. You never notice anything other than if you've never seen a pillar, you might not notice it. I mean, I don't think... You've seen other, someone who'd never seen any solid object you can't find, you know, so it, the pillar is not, it won't work on this. You know, they have the thing about someone looks at a mirror, they don't see anything. They, they, apparently some people in the South see, some anthropologists say, I find it hard to believe because they look in bodies of water and things. They've seen reflections, right? They've seen reflections of the moon in water, but the, some anthropologists think that they look in the mirror, they don't know what they're doing, seeing. So they look at a photograph they can't recognize. And maybe, I don't know about that. But point is, this is not a matter of what is it do. The matter is, if when you've seen it disappear, you then realize that you project in it what you've pre-imagined about it. And you begin to realize that what you've imagined about things in the world are not in them. They're your projections. And so the things are empty of your projections. That puts the responsibility for what you project on your mind. It makes you realize that you and the world are, in some sense, your creation. So therefore, you become more responsible for your creations. You become more of a poet in a certain way, is the idea. Rather than you, go, you become a nihilist and go around thinking everything doesn't exist. That's a, that would be a, a mistaken, which is actually a lot in early study of Buddhism, a lot, especially from East Asia side, where in, through Chinese, the critical analysis of the Sanskrit language, the Pali language, the Indian you know, philosophers who were the greatest, you know, mental, psychological philosophers that ever lived were the Indian ones. And the Chinese language didn't really take that degree of, because it wasn't inflected, didn't have grammatical cases, verb conjugations, it's this character system, you know. But my, now, then later, eventually over a thousand years of Buddhism, they became more where they could translate some of those things, the Chinese. And, and now they're doing science and they're creating all kind of new words from science, you know, they, which they have done with those particles that they have. But uh, so from that, they got conflating emptiness and nothingness. And a number of early translators translated emptiness as nothingness and, and add into the sort of thinking that Buddhism was kind of justifying and agreeing with modern nihilism. The Japanese in English writing somewhat did that, like the Kyoto School and other people like that. It could be a what? Or it could be a really long wall. Or yes, sure. Or a pillar. So by bringing that into your nirvana, um, are you thinking that with so much anticipation of what they mean, describing it, 
Because of what? Some sort of subjectivity to accept an idea. So OK. So you're becoming more aware of the role of your subjectivity in your perception of it. Yeah. That's the that's this purpose of the of this philosophical thing. That is the absolute purpose of it. And actually, you know, in a way, like if, if you're familiar with the writings of David Hume, for example, or even Kant, their critiques have to do with criticizing the naive realism of the unreflective person, you know, and, and Wittgenstein very much so. And uh, so they're, in a way, they're in line with the, what these Buddhist philosophers did thousands of years earlier. And the, the West is coming to this line. And there's a lot more influence, actually, from the discovery of things in Asia, or Asian thought in the Western philosophy than they're willing to admit. But that's another topic. But anyway, that's very good, what, what you're th how you're thinking about it. It's very, very good. And if you look at, in this book, if you look at here, some of the long footnotes that talk about different kinds of ideas of intrinsic identity, in some levels of the epistemological level, it connects a little bit to Kant's idea of Ding an sich. And, that, and Kant, in his thinking of the inaccessibility of the Ding an sich, the thing in itself, he means conceptual inaccessibility. He's, he's very fits with a, there was a great Russian translator named Shabatsky. There's a Buddhist a book he wrote called, two volumes called Buddhist Logic, where he connects Kant's breakthrough, epistemological breakthrough, with Dignaga and Dharmakirti's breakthrough in the 6th and 7th century in India, in Sanskrit, in a really interesting way. Some people criticize him since then uh, from Tibetan perspective, but that's because they never read Kant. You know, they, so they, 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 he, he's still way beyond them, in my opinion, although he was 100 years ago, Chervatsky was. Anyway, oh, it's late, hey. Okay, all right, are you all right? Don't walk into the pillar now. <laughs> Don't bump your head in the pillar. And have a nice week, and I hope to see you. I think we're meeting next week, are we? Are we? Is there, are we meeting on Wednesday next week or Friday? Wednesday. Okay. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's that? Sure. Get any information on Lake Uomo?